Well, hello to you who are watching today. Welcome to Movement Church Online. My name is Chris, and I'm the lead pastor here at Movement Church. I'm so glad and honored that you would make the decision to join us for this time today. We're going to spend about 45 minutes together today as we open the Word of God, as we study the Word of God together, as we spend a little bit of time in worship and prayer together. We're so glad that you're here and ready to do that and ready to jump in with us. Today, we're in part four of our series, Self, and I want to just give you a little bit of a sneak peek of what's coming next week. Next week, we're going to begin, I'm going to begin a brand new series called House Key. Called House Key, we're going to talk about the invitation that we've all been given to find and follow Jesus, to find God as we follow Jesus, the invitation that Jesus gave to his disciples and all he gives to every single one of us. So next week is going to be an incredible series to join us, whether in person or online. I want to make sure that you do that. It's also going to be a great week to share with someone or to invite someone to church. So if you're joining us in person, it's a great time to bring someone with you. If you're joining us online, it's a great time to make sure that you're sharing the word with someone that you think could help be helped by the word of God. But today is also a fantastic day to share as we finish up our series self. We're going to talk about self-discipline, which is always fun to talk about, right? We're going to talk about how we build the life that God has called us to live and experience everything that God's called us to experience. So make sure you're ready to pay, pay attention. Maybe grab a notebook to take a few notes. We're going to jump right into the finale and the fourth part of our series self. So today we conclude our series, Self, and I hope this has been a really helpful series for you as we talk about who you were created to be and how you were created to live in this world as yourself. From the jump, we've said that all of us eventually realize that our self is not enough for ourselves, that living a life trying to be self-confident, self-assured, self-reliant, and self-fulfilled never really works out for very long because our self is never really enough for ourselves. And when faced with that reality, we have two options. One is to work harder to build up ourself or to do what Jesus did and empty ourself, to take everything we have and everything we are and trust it in the hands of our good and loving and wise heavenly Father, then the last two weeks we've talked about self-awareness, that as we are more aware of ourself, we become more aware of our need for a savior. It's a challenging thought. And then last week we talked about self-control, that self-control is more than just saying no to another brownie or saying no to a late night adventure. Self-control is when nothing else and no one else controls yourself. Self-control is when nothing else and no one else controls yourself. When no one else and nothing else besides God dictates what you do and who you become and what you choose. We left off last week by saying this, I won't be mastered by anything, but I will serve the master above everything. I won't be mastered by anything, but I will serve the master above everything. That no one else and nothing else will control me, but I will be led by God as he brings control into my life. I'll trust the one who's in control over everything. So we have talked about a lot. Like those are some really big ideas in a series like this. What it takes to be the self that God created you to be as you live as yourself while emptying yourself into the hands of God. This is big stuff. And today we got one more thing that it takes to be the self that God created yourself to be. And here's what it is self-discipline. You're like, okay, oh, self-awareness, self-control. What a surprise. Something even worse, self-discipline. I don't want self-discipline, but here's how I would define self-discipline. Here's how we're going to define it today. Self-discipline is the personal choices we repeatedly make that develop the life that God desires for our self. Let me read it one more time. Self-discipline is the personal choices we repeatedly make that develop the life God desires for ourself. Now, let me tell you what I've learned about that phrase over the last three years of my life. For the last three years of my life, I have been involved in what has felt like a life or death struggle with two people that are incredibly important to me in my life to help them learn something that I believe is an incredibly important thing for them as they go through life. It's something that they got to get. They just can't, they can't live life without this particular thing. And, and they just, it's really been a struggle to get them to learn this thing. And if you can't guess what or who I'm talking about yet, yes, I am talking about my two daughters and the joys and terrors of potty training. Now, when I say three years, it's actually been longer. We made the mistake of being overambitious with our oldest, and we tried to start potty training before she was even two years old. We had this phenomenal idea uh, to try to get her potty trained before the arrival of our second daughter. And so at one year and 10 months old, we tried to start potty training. 
Not a great idea. If you ever want to hear about the worst day in my life, talk to me about that day. Jalen had read and studied up on this potty training method that was like 70, 72 hours to fully potty train. It's a method where for like three days, there's no pants and there's a lot of liquids. You want them to have to use the toilet a lot and you don't want them to have, the me have to mess with pulling pants up and down. It's great in theory terrible in practice for us. Now, like an evil genius, Jalen magically had a work trip to Albuquerque that got scheduled the day that we had assigned as the start day of the 72 hours. So she made sure I knew the general rules of the game and I felt confident because of course I felt self-confident. But you know that old statement where everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face? Well, I had a plan and I felt confident and then Noble woke up. I mean, I fed her breakfast. I asked if she was ready to start potty training and she said, yes. And she was absolutely not, absolutely not. And in the first two hours, in the first two hours of attempting to have her potty train, she peed 19 times on the floor, 19 times on the floor, zero times in the toilet, and five of the 19 times that were on the floor also included on my feet. Jalen called after that two hours, she was on her lunch break while she was up in Albuquerque, and she asked, well, how's it going? I said, it's going bad. It's going, it's going real, real, real bad. She's like, well, what are you doing wrong? I was like, I'm not doing it. She, she's peed on the floor 19 times. She's like, well, why aren't you getting her to the bathroom? I'm like, I don't know, she just starts peeing everywhere. It's crazy. I tried through the rest of the day. I got Noble down for her nap time eventually, and I was like, I think, I think she's not ready. I think she's not ready. She woke up from her nap. Jalen was, 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 was gonna be home soon. I tried again. She peed all over the place again. I was like, this is just not, not going well. And when Jalen got home later that night, we made the decision. She was not ready to start yet. From that point until today, it's been a little over three years. We have had all the ups and downs of potty trainings, ups when they were doing well and everyone was on the same page, yay! Downs when you hit those terrible regressions that are inevitable. If you wanna terrify a parent of a, te of a toddler, just say the word regression regression, oh, uh, terrifying. The uh, ups when you have like a month in a row with no accidents, downs that follow instantly where there's like six accidents in two days, ups when Noble was pretty well trained and Marvel hadn't really started, like that was the best days of our life. Like those were the best days of my life. It was great, like Marvel was, Noble was done, Marvel hadn't started. Downs when you realize that moment when Noble was trained, Marvel would be starting to potty train in like two weeks. Like it's been a never ending, someone is potty training. Now here's the reason I tell you that. Here's the reason I tell you that. There's a truth that was particularly frustrating for me throughout the process over the last few years, but it's a reality of, of life. It's a reality of this potty training thing. We want them to be potty trained. And there were points along the way where it really seemed like each of them were completely done and trained. No accidents, they're getting to the bathroom on time, getting to the bathroom, doing everything well, everything was going right. But the reality of the situation was this, we thought they were potty trained when we were potty trained. Does this make sense? We thought they were potty trained because we were potty trained. We as parents were paying really close attention to the schedule, setting timers, watching how much liquids they had drank. We were really well trained, but the girls had not been trained at all. And so the second we let up on the schedule, the second we let, let, let up on the liquids, the second we encountered, hoped in, that, they, that they would take a little more initiative, we found out, no, they aren't trained, we are trained. And here's the reality of the situation, and some of you parents, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. They aren't potty trained until they are potty trained. See, we thought they were potty trained because we were potty trained, but the reality of the situation is they aren't potty trained until they are potty trained. Me as a parent wanting them to be potty trained didn't make either of my girls potty trained. Me being disciplined as a parent to pay attention to their schedules and their liquid intake did not make them potty train. Me wanting that and being willing to do whatever it took to help them did not make them potty train. It was only when they paid attention to their schedules, only when they knew how to pay attention to their bodies, when they were willing to stop playing and do, go do business, that they were potty trained. Now, the reason I tell you all that is not just so I could say potty a bajillion times in, ch in church online, that's just an added bonus. But the reason I tell you that is simple and I hope it's kind of clear. 
There are things that God, your loving and wise Heavenly Father, wants for you, things you were made for, things that in your life will be the defining marks of Christian maturity that God wants for you and calls you toward. But as much as God wants them for you, and as much as He has done to make them available to you, they won't be the reality of your life until you choose to be disciplined and consistent in doing the things that will develop that in you and develop the life that God desires for you. That you won't experience that as the reality of your life until you repeatedly make the decisions and get disciplined about putting the things into practice that actually build and develop the life that God desires for you and the things that you desire for you as you follow God. Now, what's interesting about this is the Apostle Paul wrote about this very dynamic in his letter to the Corinthian church. To this church that, as as I explained last week, he had had so much dysfunction, so much misunderstanding about so many different things. Paul, after kind of clearing some of that stuff up, he wrote this incredible verse about running a race, about being self-disciplined, about choosing self-discipline in the when, when we could choose our rights, when we could choose our freedoms, when we could choose a whole lot of different things. Paul says, I want to encourage you to actually choose self-discipline, to be disciplined, to build a life that honors God and that, and that loves and takes care of yourself, that actually makes sure that your life, that yourself is living for God. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 24, here's what Paul, run, Paul wrote. He said, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. The prize. Now, every here's the, here's what Paul's ultimately saying. Not everyone has a, who has a goal accomplishes the goal. It's great to have a goal. You should have goals in life. You should have things that you want for yourself. You should have things that you care about. You should have things that you know God wants for you that you're willing to pursue. But not everyone who has a goal accomplishes the goal. That is unfortunately true. You've known plenty of people who set out with big ambitions in life, but they never reached their lofty ambitions because they weren't living life in a way that would accomplish their goals. See, here's what we have to understand. Daily habits will either accomplish or undermine your goals. The things that we choose every day, whether we realize they're habits or not, are habits because we choose them every day. The things that you choose every day, your daily habits, they will either help you accomplish the things that you want to accomplish in life, or they will serve to undermine the things that you want to accomplish in life. See, diet and exercise, it's a regular discipline. Diet and exercise is regular discipline. Whether you have great diet and exercise or terrible diet and exercise, they either serve to help you, help you accomplish your goals or they undermine your health and health and physical goals. Staying on a budget or living outside of your budget, those are both daily disciplines and daily habits. Whether you're always spending too much money or whether you're living within your means, they're daily habits and they either serve or they undermine your financial goals. Time reading scripture is a daily discipline or it's not. And if you're trying to grow closer to God, it's a discipline that either helps you grow closer to God because you do it or a discipline that keeps you away from God because you don't do it. Time and prayer is the same way. It's a daily thing. If you do it, it helps you grow closer to God, which is what you want. If you don't do it, you end up further and further from God because you're not spending time with him in prayer. Time connected with other believers, it's a regular discipline and that may not be daily, but it needs to be weekly. That It's either something that helps you grow closer to God because you do it on a regular basis or it's something that keeps you away from God because you're not doing something that you know you should do. Our daily habits, our daily habits will either accomplish or undermine your goals. And Paul says, you have to realize that not everyone who's running is going to cross the finish line. Not everyone who runs wins. That there is actually someone who wins. There's actually someone who crosses. There are people who run, but they're not running with the goal in mind. And you need to run your race and you need to live your life, Paul would say, understanding that what you do every day will either help you or it will hinder you from accomplishing the the things that you want and from living the life that God has for you. Verse 25, he went on to say this, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. If you're watching right now, would you type in the chat bar, strict training? training or wherever you are right now, would you say strict training on the count of three? Ready? One, two, three. Strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. 
See, here's what Paul's ultimately saying here. The life we're living determines the life we'll someday live. The life we're living determines the life that we will someday live. The life we're living determines the life we'll someday live. In this life, you will either build a life centered around this life or a life centered around the life to come. There will be one or the other, but you cannot do both. It will either be centered around this life or it will be centered around the life to come. If you're a Jesus follower, what Paul is ultimately saying is this, you have to live a life focused on more than this life. Paul says it's time for you to make a decision to choose, to, to choose discipline in the way you build your life because as a Jesus follower, you don't live life for the things of this world. So he says, you, like a runner in a race, it's time for you to go into strict training. It's time for you to choose self-discipline because self-discipline about the right things will build a life that is focused not just on this life, but is focused on the life to come. This is what's called living in light of eternity, knowing that this life is not the only life we will live, knowing that there is an eternity to come, and knowing that we will live in eternity and experience in eternity what we chose and who we choose in this life, that if Jesus matters most in this life, we get to experience an eternity with Jesus. If something else matters more than Jesus, we don't get Jesus in eternity. We want to live in the light of eternity because the life that we're living determines the life that we will someday live. We want to live and choose self-discipline and go into strict training, knowing that they're doing it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Eternity with our Heavenly Father in the presence of our Savior. Verse 26 and 27, he wrote this. He said, therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after pre having preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Let me read that one more time. There's some, some, some interesting things there. He says, therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Now, two things. Really big, important thing up here. Self-discipline is my choice, but discipline is a part of everyone's life. Self-discipline is my choice, but discipline is a part of everyone's life. Meaning, either you discipline yourself, meaning you routinely make the choices and build the habits that build the life that you want and the life that God wants for you, or you will experience the other side of discipline, where because you haven't been intentional in the choices that you make or the habits that you embrace or the relationships that you make a priority, you experience life's discipline where you can't live the life that you want or the life that God has for you. You're separated from those things because of the life that you have built by the choices that you didn't make intentionally. You will either be disciplined by yourself or you will be disciplined by life or by someone else, but everyone experiences discipline. Paul says, I choose to make it my body. I choose... I, I, I beat my own body. I, I discipline myself. I beat my own body. I give, it, I give my own body a blow. This is my choice. I choose self-discipline so that life never has to discipline me. I choose self-discipline so I can live the life that I want. I choose self-discipline so I can be close to God like I want to be close to God. I choose self-discipline so I can experience the things that I know God has for me. And, and when the alternative is I choose nothing and I experience whatever life brings about correction in my life. Self-discipline is my choice, but whether or not you choose self-discipline, at some point along the way, you will experience some form of discipline. Paul would say, why not just choose to discipline yourself so that you don't have to be disciplined by life or by God or by, or by, or by anyone else? Choose self-discipline. It is your choice. But I also notice in this, he says, Paul, Paul wants to win the, win the prize. He wants to not be disqualified for the prize. You want to know what the prize is? The life that God has for you in the here and now and the life God has for you then and there. That as we said a few weeks ago, that Je following Jesus, it should actually make you better at this life and it offers you eternal life. 
Following Jesus makes you better at this life and he offers you eternal life. The prize is the life that God has for you here and now, that it should be better because you follow Jesus, that as you choose self-discipline, as you follow Jesus, your life in the here and now actually does get better. As you, as you practice self-discipline, you live in more freedom. You live with more peace. You live with less anxiety. You live with less stress. You're choosing self-discipline and the life in the here and now gets better. But also, as you choose a, a better life, as you choose to follow Jesus in the here and now, you get to live with Jesus in the then and there, in the life to come. Paul says, here's the prize. Here's why we choose self-discipline. We choose self-discipline so we live the life that God wants for us in the here and now, and we'll live with God in the life that he has built for us in the then and there. And if we don't choose self-discipline, Paul says, we may accidentally find ourselves being disqualified from either prize. We won't live the life that that God wants for us in the here and now, and we won't get to live life with God in the then and there. So Paul says, choose self-discipline. Now, ultimately, what's interesting about this is Paul was echoing the words of a man named Solomon who wrote in the Old Testament, he's the son of David. He was, a, he was one of the greatest kings in the history of Israel. He wrote almost as much as his father, but he wrote specifically about wisdom. And he, in one chapter that he wrote, he wrote an incredible chapter that deals a lot with self-discipline, that deals a lot with choosing discipline for ourselves so that life does not have to discipline Uh, In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 32, he said this, those who disregard discipline despise themselves. Those who disregard discipline despise themselves, but the one who heeds correction gains understanding. Those who disregard discipline despise themselves. Let me ask you a question. As we, if you refuse self-discipline, If you refuse self-discipline, if you refuse to discipline yourself, if you refuse to build a life built on discipline that builds the right things in your life, is it possible that you are despising yourself, that you are harming yourself, that you are hurting yourself because unknowingly you are keeping yourself from the life that you want and the life that you know God wants for you? Those who disregard discipline despise themselves. But the one who heeds correction or the one who chooses discipline gains understanding. This is, this is the incredible thing that Paul, that Paul said, that Solomon said, that we choose discipline or we receive discipline. We choose it ourselves or we live with the consequences of someone else having to discipline us or life having to discipline us or God having to discipline us. That we, re, that we choose discipline or we receive it. We embrace discipline or we receive it. That we self-discipline or someone else has to discipline us. So here's the thing. As, as, we, as we close out this series self, here, here's, what, here's what I think this looks like for, for a lot of us. We have to understand that there actually is a life that God wants for us. In the same way that I want for my daughters to be potty trained, not for my own benefit, although at this point, there's some of it that I want it for my benefit. But I know as they go to school, as they live life, potty trained is kind of a prerequisite that's required. And if you're not doing that, life is going to be hard for you. In the same way, there's a God who is a good, a perfect, a wise, loving, heavenly father who has a life that he wants for you, who has a specific life that he wants for you, who has some characteristics that he desires to be true of you and for you and about you in your life. There are some things, in other words, to say, in another way to say this, there are some things that you were made for. There are some things that you were made to experience that life doesn't really feel right if you don't experience these things because you were made by your good and loving and perfect and wise heavenly father to experience these things. But as we've said throughout this day, you won't really experience those things if you aren't intentional and disciplined about choosing the disciplines and the habits that develop those things in your life. And so here's the way I would say this. I was made for blank, which means I need to blank. Again, you're like, like, this series has a lot of blanks. Well, yeah, there's a lot of things that, that you were made for. There's a few specific things that you were made for. I can't just put one thing in the blank right now. But here's the overarching principle. I was made for this, which means I need to do that. I was made for this, which means I need to live a life and choose daily disciplines and choose regular habits that actually develop that in my life. You were created by God to experience 
this, to experience that, to experience, and we're gonna get to these and what they are in a little bit. You were created for that, but to actually live in that and experience that, you should be disciplined in the way you choose blank. They, that, that, the things that you were created for, the things that you were made for, the things that God desires most for you in your life and through your life, the things that God wants from you, you have to be disciplined like I have to be disciplined to choose those things and to choose to live a life that builds and develops those things through the disciplines and the daily habits. So here's the first one I would say as, as we talk about these. You were made for influence. You were made for influence. As, as a follower of Jesus Christ, as someone who knows God, you were made for influence. Here's the thing, I think, whether, I think we're all made for influence. We have discover how much we are made for influence when we follow Jesus, but you were made to influence those around you for good, for their benefit, for their ultimate good. And so what does it look like to live a life that builds and is disciplined about choosing influence? Here's one of the best things that I think any of us can do. One of the best habits that every one of us should do as followers of Jesus who have been called to go into the world and to make disciples. What if you develop the habit of consistently and habitually inviting people to church sharing the gospel, spreading the news on, on social media and on YouTube, sharing what, what, what's happening at church, sharing what's, what God is doing in your life. What if you made the decision every day, I can't go to bed unless I have prayed for the lost to come to know Jesus, prayed for someone who is lost in my life to come to know Jesus and share or share with someone about Jesus and what he has done in my life or invited someone to church. Like what if every week you're like, you know what, I like it's part of my weekly routine. I've got to invite someone to come to church with me. And whether or not they come, that's up to them. But I've got to make sure that as part of my life, as part of my life's work, as part of my living to be to be a person of influence, that I'm going to invite people to church, that I'm going to share the good news of Jesus, that I'm going to spread the word, that I'm going to pray for people to come to know Jesus. And here's why I said, you're like, what does that have to do influence. There is no greater influence on the world than to share the gospel with one. There is no greater influence on the that you can have on the world than to share the gospel with someone. That when you lead someone to faith in Jesus, you become someone who has influenced the world for the better, influenced your world for the better, influenced our city for the better, influenced a family for the better. That the greatest impact and the greatest influence that we can have on the world is to share Jesus with someone. So you were made for influence. What if you decided to build a daily habit or a weekly habit of I've got to share Jesus with someone today? I'm telling you, if you're made for influence, that's one of the best decisions that you could make. You were also made for community. You were made for influence and you were made for community. So here's what you do. If you were made for community, you know what the decisions you have to make? To pursue community. Here's what I know and here's what you know. Life changes once you become an adult. Once you're done with school, life changes and looks different. Community is not automatically around you. You have to pursue it. You have to build friendships. You actually have to build friendships, which means you have to work for friendships. And so what if you made the decision, I was made for community, but it got harder and it changed when I became an adult and I've never really realized what's so different about it that I actually have to work for it, but I'm willing to do the work. I'm willing to do the work. So I'm gonna pursue community. I'm gonna invest in community. I'm gonna intentionally build community. I'm gonna choose community over isolation. Here's what I know. Here's what I realized when I turned about 24, when I turned 25 and I moved to a new city that was about 1,500 miles away from where I had lived before and from all of my family, that I had to choose community over isolation. That isolation was easy and isolation came natural. It was easy for me to sit on my couch and play video games. It was more difficult. It took more work to go find someone to spend some time with that had a busy schedule, that also had, a di had di different things going on, that also wanted to choose isolation. That instead of choosing isolation, it's important to choose community. We choose community over isolation. Here's what someone said to me about choosing a small group a couple a couple years ago, and I love the way they said this. The reason that I love small group is it puts friendship on the calendar. It puts friendship on the calendar. So if you're watching this, you're going like, I, I need to choose community. Maybe you're at home and you've been isolated for a long time. It's time to choose community over isolation. And maybe you have some reasons you've been isolated. Maybe COVID has caused you to be a little more isolated than you normally would be. But it's time to choose community in some way, to reach out to someone, to send a text to someone, to make a call to someone, to say like, hey, every week I've got to spend time with someone or talking, talking with someone on the phone or talking with someone by Zoom. But I, I would just encourage you, if you're part of our church in some way, shape or form, I would encourage 
encourage you to figure out a way to be part of a small group because as my friend said a number of years ago, small group puts friendship on the calendar. It makes space in your calendar and space in your week every single week for friendship, for community, for the opportunity for someone to speak into your life and for the opportunity for you to speak into someone else's life, for someone else to make you stronger and for you to make someone else stronger, for you to make someone else sharper and for someone else to make you sharper because iron sharpens iron and we're called to make each other better. So friendship is something that you gotta put on your calendar. You were made for ministry. You're made for influence. You're made community. Community. You were made for ministry. It's you were made for ministry. You were made to take your talents and your abilities and 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 your and your time and to use everything about you to serve someone and to serve to to serve the God who loves you. To serve the local church. To serve people. You were made to minister. Now, minister is not a person. Ministry is a is is a thing that we are all called to as we follow Jesus. It's not that one person is called to ministry. It's that the whole church is called to ministry. This is why Paul talked about the body of Christ, because a hand can't do everything that the body is called to do. The hand needs the elbow and the shoulder and the bicep and the tricep and the forearm and the kneecap and the and the and the and the uh, calf and the toes and the ankle bones. It needs the whole body has to work together, which means everyone has to work. As we minister, we're, there, there's a reason that we don't actually feel complete, that we don't feel like we're doing everything that we're supposed to do until we actually pursue a life of ministry. That doesn't mean you have to go into ministry and become a pastor. It means everything that we do, we want to live life in a way that says, I want to pour my life out for the good of someone else. I love this quote from Frederick Buechner. He said, the place that God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. That's what we do. We pour ourselves out until we find a place where we find some people where we're pouring out our lives and we're glad to do it because we're helping to meet one of the world's deepest needs or someone's deepest needs. So you find a way to serve. You find someone to serve. You find somewhere to serve. If you're trying to figure out where to serve, uh, the church is a great place. Soup kitchens and homeless shelters are great places that you find someone to serve. That there's, If there's a neighbor kid or a neighbor family who needs someone to babysit after school, and watch that watch a kid after school that's a great one to serve but you find someone to serve you find some way to serve you find somewhere to serve and then you make it a regular part of your life whether it's a daily thing or a weekly thing you find someone and somewhere and some way to serve you were made for a life of ministry you were also made finally for generosity you were made for a life that gives away what's been given to you. You were made for generosity. You were made for a life that gives away what has been given to you. So you give of your time, you give of your talent, you give of your energy, and you give of your finances. And I think this isn't just a thing where we give what's left. God actually wants what's best. So we give the best of our time. We give the best of our talent. We give the best of our energy. And we give the we give first of our finances. We are called to a life of generosity where we don't accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and we don't keep it all to ourselves, but we actually take what God has given to us and we give a portion of it back to God and to those around us so that we don't start to think that life is all about us. You were made for generosity. You were made to give away what God has given to you. And it's time to make some decisions for some of you. If you're going to experience and live the life that God wants for you to live, it's time to make some decisions and choose some disciplines that actually build the life that God has called you to, to not just be a person who wants to be generous, but to choose choose generosity and to choose it over and over and over again. And finally, you were made for intimacy with God. You were made to be close to your heavenly father. You were meant to grow in your relationship with him. You were close called to be closer with him tomorrow than you are today. And you're called to be closer to him today than you were yesterday. You're called to take step after step after step after step toward your heavenly father. You were made for connection with God. And it's time for some of us to choose the disciplines every single day and to choose regular disciplines that get us closer to our Heavenly Father, that help us take a step toward God. What this looks like on a daily basis is to spend time studying the Word of God, to spend some time reading the Word of God, to spend some time in the Psalms, to spend some time in the Proverbs, to spend some time in the Gospels, to spend some time reading Paul's letters, that whatever you read in the Bible, read something that grows your connection to God and read it every day. And you know what's true if you can't read five chapters? Read four. And if you can't read four, you read three. And if you if you can't read two, you miss, you, you read one. And here's the amazing thing about that. Here's some of us were like, well, I'm so bad at habits and I keep missing a day. But here's the great news. If you miss one day, don't miss two. 
If you miss two days, don't miss three. That the best day to begin a new discipline is today. And the best day to start over is today. And the best day to keep doing what you did the last day is today. And the best day to keep building on the discipline that you've been building is today. When, when, to, to, to build a discipline of prayer. You're thinking, how, how can communication with God be a discipline? Sometimes we're not good at it when we start. Sometimes we don't really know how to pray or what to pray, but, it can, but we get better at it through discipline. We get more connection with God as we spend time routinely in prayer. You're like, it, it, the, the communication, I don't know about like that, that, that comes easy, but actually getting and sit down and pray, that's hard. That's the discipline part, okay? To make choices every single day and every single week to make a choice that church matters, that whether it's church online or church in person, that church matters matters because it's time getting the word of God in front of my face, someone opening the word of God and teaching it to me and spending some time in worship where we connect to our heavenly father. This is what daily and weekly connection looks like with our heavenly father. And as you do those things, you grow closer to your heavenly father because you're making some choices to stay disciplined about the things that build your connection with your heavenly father. See, you were made for influence. You were made for community. You were made for ministry. You're made for generosity and you were made for connection with God. And for all of us, it's time that we choose self-discipline as the way that we will build those things in our life. And what we are made for, we will choose to build. That what we were made for, we won't wait and hope around that it just magically happens, but we'll choose to be disciplined as Paul said. We'll make our time and our schedule and our energy and we'll make all of that to serve us instead of serving that. We'll choose to be self-disciplined so we can build the life that God has for ourself. That that's what God created yourself to be. That's what God created yourself to experience. And it's time that we start living toward those things and building those things as we choose self-discipline. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for what you have done for us. Thank you for Jesus and the blood that he shed on the cross for us so that our self could know your self, so that our self could be brought back into a relationship with yourself. And so that in the very first place, we could begin to think about the life that you have for ourself and for myself. So God, today, I thank you for all of that. And I pray that you would give us incredible wisdom to know what areas of, of our life most need some self-discipline. And God, then give us the courage to actually choose it, to choose it today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. And God, as we choose to be disciplined about the things that you want us to be disciplined, as we choose to make daily and weekly habits about the things that you want us to be disciplined in, would you meet our wisdom? Would you meet our, our courage? And God, would you build the life that you want for every single one of us? So God, help us to experience these things. God, help us to choose self-discipline so that we ultimately choose the life that you have for us. We love you, God. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you.
Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, hopefully, hopefully it's been encouraging and challenging. Hopefully it helps you take some step towards Jesus and makes you a better follower of Jesus because of the 45 minutes that we spent together today. I want to let you know a few next steps that you could take in engaging with our church. First of all, we want to let you know the ways that you can give. If you want to give today, you can give online. You can give with our cash app. You can give with a text or you can give by sending cash or check to our PO box. But however and whenever you give, I really want to say thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your obedience to God. Thank you for believing in the mission of our church to lead people in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and to keep creating environments in person and online that help people take their first step or their next step in connection with Jesus. So thank you so much for doing that. Again, the ways that you can give are all listed on screen. And we just want you to want to say thank you so much for your generosity. We also want to let you know if you have a need today, we would love to hear from you so that we know how we can pray for you and how we can partner with you to meet your needs. So the ways that you can let us know they're on screen, whether it's by Facebook, by text, by phone, or by email, you can let us know at any of those ways. And we'll be looking forward to hearing from you so we can know how we can pray for you, how we can pastor you, and how we can partner with you to hopefully be able to meet your need. And then finally, also want to remind you, our kids' experiences go live every Sunday at 10 a.m. on both Facebook and YouTube, and they're a great way to keep your kids' faith going and growing uh, at home, whether it's whether it's a supplement to in-person or whether it's their, their experience of, of our church uh, online. We're so glad to be able to do that, and they're a great way. My family loves watching these and enjoying some, wor some kids' worship, some kids' worship songs, and some great teaching th on, on their level. It's fantastic. So I encourage you to check those out if you've got kids in, in preschool or in elementary school. So that's all we've got today. Look forward to seeing you next week as we begin our brand new series, House Key. We'll see you then. And until then, have a great week and keep being the movement.